but we started this like this red pack right in because we were all like oh well we're all cooped up and we like talking to each other and we should we right. should chat and record this and see what happens so like the first one like was spawned out of the fact that we were all like well that's true let's let's start a show <laughs> hey so here's my question for you two so what's changed the most not like in our personal and kind of you know the the background of you know our, our kind of our lives but like as it relates to cybersecurity, our world's kind of the, 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 the work area, you know, that you live in, like what's changed? I mean, cause I was thinking you're right. It's been over a year. So we're, it's kind of a metric of this whole pandemic time frame. So like what's changed the most for you, Brian? I have seen, it's interesting. So, you know, like third-party questionnaires come into like our clients and they're, you know, from their customers who are trying to assess them. Everyone's doing the assessment game and that's a whole nother story. But what's been interesting is, Getting people to actually start really understanding how risk decisions are being made around why certain things are risks or not because of this one example. Hey, client, you know, big customer comes down to client. Um, you know, why don't you have a NAC implemented and port level access implemented in your office? That's a risk. We need to know who's plugging in. Client response, no one's in our office. It's like, oh, that's 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 interesting. And it it's not that it's like the aha, it's a total like duh, like this shouldn't be. Yeah. Right. It, it's that conversation has has broken the barrier for people who are assessing clients mm. and assessing those to go, oh wait, we we could just not have to just look at checking this box if you're doing this thing or not. We should question the relative risk of the thing we're asking you. Yeah. And and I'm sitting here as a practitioner going. This is what we've been trying to say all along. <laughs> like, <laughs> we made a connection. We did it. So, that so this for is me literally is never waste awesome. a good crisis for you. Yeah, yeah. like it's like, hey, yeah. like we can. So it's like, hey, let's start with this question. Are you asking that question? You are. Okay, let's just start with that and use that as an example to talk about the rest of the things that maybe we're yeah. not doing here and why, and then yeah. the areas that we are and why. And make sure that you're happy with it. So I've seen that shift where people are really starting to better understand the risk because, and I think we've talked about this before, People, most people don't understand IT, let alone security, because of how it operates on the logical plane. They understand the physical plane because you can touch it. Now we've got a relative risk associated with the physical plane that people can really go, oh, like I can put my hands around it. I understand what you mean. There's no one yeah. there. We don't have to worry about anybody plugging in because there's literally no one going in there, not even the, not even the cleaning staff. The thing that I've um, seen the most, I've actually been very grateful for, and I think, I think Brian can likely relate to this as well, is that during the pandemic, doing work virtually or even serving clients virtually has become acceptable. Pre-pandemic, mm -hmm. there's still that, um, let's just say that perception that value could only be had if an advisor consultant was physically at a job center, physically at the location of a business, you know, and that, and that, that hindered our, our company's growth for, 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 for years. Now all of a sudden the pandemic hit and then it became, you know, like a better term, socially acceptable to be able to provide value remotely. And people could see mm -hmm. that you could actually provide yeah. value remotely. That's now that's allowed us to, to serve all sorts of different organizations. And I mean, heck, even just in my own backyard, there's a, there's a, a company that reached out and they said, well, we need help with CMMC. And I said, you know what? I'll introduce you to, to, to Brian and, and his team at Side Channel. They're far more equipped to deal with that than, oh, hey, hey. than, than we are. Um, and FYI, Brian's still waiting for my thank you fruit basket, but that's a separate point. But <laughs> You get stuck in customs. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, it made, it's sitting somewhere on the Montana border. It's trying to get north. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how much fruit is left on when it gets gets to, uh, fully up into Canada here. But um, that, that, that's the bit for me, Dash, that I, I've, I've – for me, as a, especially as a business owner, someone trying to scale a business, yeah. I've appreciated the most, you know, and again, crisis turning an opportunity. Uh, it's it's definitely, again, I think it's really helped people understand that, you know what, you don't need to be flying consultants all over, all over the country or all yeah. over the continent, right? You can provide value. You can do security consulting work anywhere, right? Is it nice to mm -hmm. see people face to face? Sure. Yeah, Dutch, what do you, I mean, with, yeah. within, you're, you're pr predominantly cloud focused, right? I mean, have you seen you know, the yeah. obvious uptick? I mean, as a someone who's outside of that, I've seen a lot more people going to there and trying to help them do the right thing. But you're, a, right. we'll say on the receiving end, 
like sure. That. Yeah, and I think that I, I think a lot of um, uh, analysts were correct, even you know two and a half, three years ago, that that sort of the early adopters, whatever phrase that you know that you like for that, right? That the, the, those people had dirty jumped the chasm, jumped the shark, whatever, mm-hmm. um, you know, and had adopted. But you know, the, you're seeing acceleration, and to me, cloud is just a part of that acceleration, right? So things that probably most security architects, directors of security, CISOs wanted to do anyway three years ago, mm-hmm. that they, they, they really got, uh, you know, the acceleration behind that because of the events, right? And you right. guys just talked about kind of two, two, two dirt sort of somewhat downstream, you know, ways that that plays out. But that's the biggest thing is that it's really changed that CISOs, have gotten a seat at the adult table, right? As I as I've jokingly said before, but I mean it because it's a, to me at least it's an analogy that resonates with me, right? I mean, so they're they're, they're really being they, there's a recognition that it's so critical, you know, that this the, the digital transformation it was all happening and it was so much of a it was almost like a meme, right? We talk about digital transformation, people are like oh my god, stop talking about that, but it was true, and I think it was undervalued at how much of an impact that has. So I you know today. I see a portion of a CISO role as being a business risk advisor. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's sort of like, you had forward leaning people who were saying that, you know, three years ago, but now I see much more of a appreciation that that's where we are, right? That, that a CISO, because of their experience and, and to some degree, probably their, the way they've been taught to think and, and, and observe things, they're really good risk advisors, period. Not just mm-hmm. cybersecurity risk, but risk advisors. And so I see a lot more understanding that, hey, you know, um, yes, we need to put somebody who understands risk on the board or cybersecurity risk on the board. And, and I see more growth of cybersecurity risk committees or subcommittees at large scale enterprises. But just in general, I start to, I've seen much more of an appreciation that, hey, this is integral to the business. I mean, because we all just got slapped in our faces, Dom, to your point. I mean, or Brian, to your point too, right? Everybody suddenly became remote. You both said that, right? And that just ch- broke sort of the mental models, not the not the logical models, not the way that we always thought of it as practitioners, but it broke kind of it made a clean break with a lot of people's older mental models of well, how do we do things? Oh, well, I have a even if it was wrong, they're like, oh, we have a da- we have a closet and then we have a data center. And, then, and even though we know a lot of that had already changed, right? People have gone to hosted, they have gone to colos, you know, yep. percentage have gone to the cloud. It just stopped that notion completely. Everybody went home mm-hmm. and, it, it, and you're not working from home. You're just working. Right. <laughs> I, I mean, it's somebody else. You said that to me and that just caught me off guard. And you're like, it's, let's stop saying work from home. You're just working. Right. Yeah. And, and so you've, you've abstracted this notion right and and Don, you talked about it from a travel standpoint i saw that as well i mean i'm like probably most of you i mean i traveled nearly every week and so that's a big change and it's really impacted those people who travel and that's also executives right so executives stopped traveling stopped having all these meetings that they were having probably at you know so no no commute right no travel it, it changes kind of the workflow and the way people look at the role. And, and, I, and I think has probably made people reflect more. What's the meaningful work I need to do? And you also have to be more intentional, right? Like you, you touched it, Brian, but we, this, this whole idea came out of, you know, us talking to each other and we're like, hey, we should do something. Well, that's the, that's the spark, right? We should do something different. But you have to change. You have to be intentional. Like now I would say... I did the stats a few months ago, but probably 70% of my team has never met each other in person. Yeah. A lot, you know, in, in the real world, it's only been virtual. And you have to have a lot of intentionality around that. Like, how do you mm-hmm. connect with each other, right? We spent 10 minutes BSing right before we hit the official record button. But that's so critical um, because you're predominantly virtual now. Yeah, I've got, um, I've got five other business partners in side channel. Right, there's total. I have only shooken hands in person with two of them. Yeah, two of them I are in California. Shift that is never, never met. One of them's in Philadelphia. I'm gonna go down and and do an Eagles game in uh, in like two oh, cool. weeks, uh, November seventh. We're gonna watch the Chargers play Eagles because I'm an Eagles fan. Don't ask me how. Long story. Um, but like, and I'll fi- and I'll finally meet him, and I'll have two other people I've never met. But you know, you. Once you break down the barriers and acceptance of like, oh, I can 
like get to know someone and they have the same intent, right? Like you said, intention. Mm-hmm. You can do great things, right? Like the three of us have never met in person, right? Right. But we've we've respected each other's content and you know opinions, and we don't agree on everything, but we <laughs> get a, we get along and can have a conversation and feel that it's meaningful for at least us. If no one else is watching, at least the three of us had you know a good hour discussion. Um, but we've never met, and I and I'm pretty sure that based on the friendship that I think I'll I'll say the three of us have built. You know, if we meet up at a conference in Iowa for, you know, SecCon, you know, 2022, we would be like, you know, people would be like, who are those three guys? Be like, right. oh, yeah, like we've known each other forever. Like they would think that. Um, yeah, yeah it's, I think it's great to see how people have taken remote and just like you said, they're just working. I will say, and I want to hear from from Dom, like the one thing that's negative is there are no buffers between meetings now (laughs) like we need to be so much more like i think crisp on our calendar our own calendar control yeah um i think that's starting to eat into people like you're going back to back to back to back because yes you can and there's no more this like oh i can't schedule that because i have to walk across campus or Mm -hmm. because i'm going to be flying in and i need to now there's just like oh no we know everyone's going to be done at the top of the hour (laughs) <laughs> so right. the next meeting that they're available can start at the top of the hour. It's like, whoa, I like to eat lunch. Sometimes I like to take a walk. Every once in a while, I need to use the washroom. <laughs> I think we just need to kind of like all like realize that that's happening uh, and kind of help each other out on that one. But that, that, that's so that's so true, Brian. You know, and and um, I, I do genuinely hope whenever we do meet that it's not in Iowa. I mean, I'm sure it's a beautiful state. <laughs> Iowa's a great else, state. That, yeah. <laughs> cyclones but hopefully we can meet or uh hopefully we can meet somewhere else but uh, to, to your point you know that's why i said one of the things i certainly struggle with i know a lot of people uh, as well in which and for me I, I have a toddler at home you know and so i wake up uh he, for whatever reason he chooses not to wake his mother up he wakes me up um but uh and then t- i take care of him in the morning and then basically from 7 a.m until 4 p.m I'm lucky if I've gotten a few nibbles of food. I'm lucky if I've been able to use the washroom once, maybe twice, if if it's a good day. Uh, it just it just all bleeds together, like you said. There, right. when we're back in an office, there were natural breaks. There are no natural mm-hmm. breaks at home, and I yeah. can't remember if it was Dutch or, or, or you, Brian, used the word intentional. I mean, I, I have found and again, it's it's an, it's an, it's more art than science. But when you when you're planning your schedule, you have to be intentional, right? Build in those breaks. And the same thing when you're scheduling with other people, recognizing that for pretty much all of us, we're, we're just running one endless Zoom meeting throughout the day. <laughs> like, yeah. if we, we need to extend compassion and kindness to one another, right? We have to recognize that you know, if someone's running a few minutes late, uh, that as I, as I was today, <laughs> um, you know, that, that there's, there's, there's an extension of compassion and, and kindness there, right? It, it's, I've noticed, especially as the pandemic has worn on, that people are less, will have a wider berth. Normally, before the pandemic, if I was two or three minutes late to a meeting, I'd get a text or email right away within two or three mm-hmm. minutes of not showing up. People now seem to have a tolerance around sort of the seven, ten minute mark. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd say, you know what? We know we're running around. We know that you know we're going from one meeting to another. Uh, I've seen that extension of, 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 of courtesy. You know, so it's it's interesting. We're, for lack of a better term, we are a new working paradigm. Like, uh, I got one I, trick for you. I don't know if you guys know this, like to help you here, right? So this is, this is, so by default, I think there's a couple different apps out there that try to help you and are like, oh, start the, start your, your meeting top of the hour and then end 10 minutes early. Right. But we all know that no one ends 10 minutes early. You just can't keep going. It's hard. Yeah, the it's trick hard. is start the meeting 10 minutes after start at two ten, and then mm. end at the top of the hour. Cause you know, you're going to end at the, everyone else ends at the top of the hour. And that way you're like, Hey, we're going to start at like two ten or two fifteen. That way you get that 10 minute buffer. I've started doing that. That's, that's actually brilliant. That's a, a really tremendous good idea. amount. The problem is like the default in like some of the apps that we use, I won't say which one I'm using, but you know, it's, yeah. you know, merges calendars and that kind of thing. It like, it doesn't offer that as like, that's the default help thing. Mm-hmm. But uh, there are some things, one of my guys actually sh- showed that like, you know, start building in the thing where it's like, Hey, don't, don't book me uh, within 15 minutes of a previous meeting. You know, or don't book more than four one hour meetings in one day. Uh, Mm -hmm. Don't allow people to get on your calendar within 24 hours of today. You know, little things like that. Like we started kind of getting into like some of our settings and being like, 
I need to control my life a little better. And actually, technology is going to help me here. So, yeah, if that helps, you know, use it. Um, you know, I've gone back to wearing a watch just so that I stop picking so up funny. my phone to look at yeah. my, look at the time. Because if I bring myself to look at my phone at the time, I'm now like, oh, oh, let me just let me just check. Oh, something. yeah. It's like, no, 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 no. It's like if I literally just need to know the time, it's like, cool. So, like, I've actually enjoyed rolling. going back to I... wearing a watch. That's funny. That's, that's good. a good. That's a good idea. Yeah. Well, just on an Apple Watch if I type your email. <laughs> yeah, dude. I don't do. I mean, I'm totally analog. Like when I. When... I do, but you know what? I don't use it. But the same thing, though. I have it turned. I don't get any alerts or anything on it. On it. I only use it, honestly just because I use it for for uh, you know uh, fitness stuff or whatever. But I really I don't either. I don't have my Outlook on here. I'm nothing. Yeah. Nothing at all. Oh, uh, yeah, Jeff, do, you, do you work out? I didn't know you. <laughs> Dude, well played, sir. Well played. <laughs> oh, shocker. So we were we were uh, chit chatting about uh... shit chat. I'm going to take your shit chat in the shitty chitty chat chat in... chat 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 in the chit chat. Why don't you need MFA? Like, is there any good reason why you would need MFA? I'm sure there's a couple, but like, I mean, top one or two, either one of you guys. What what do you think? Silence is death. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, I guess arguably if you felt confidence level in the length and complexity of passwords, you, you could, I guess, but we know emphatically that it's just too hard for people to remember. I mean, I, I just like, to me, it's, it doesn't, that dog doesn't hunt. I, I don't know when right. you wouldn't use it. I mean, I'm sure like you at every holiday dinner, I practically beg my family members to please, please, please use a password manager <laughs> and MFA. And I, and I fail a lot of times with that conversation, but I, you know, and it's sort of like to spin on that, like even when people, you know, ransomware is, is a top of mind topic, right? And, you know, and, and I would argue it's, there's recency bias with that, sure. you know, um, but but at the end of the day, if I'm just being generic and people ask about ransomware, I'm like, look, do the best practices, whatever domain you're talking about. I don't, you know, if you just do the best practices, that will take care of your ransomware. It, it's not. It's not something that's so compl complicated, and so novel. It's only novel that you're hearing about it, right. and, and perhaps the ability to leverage the ransomware because of of cryptocurrency, right? I think that's a fair statement, right? Of why it's happening. But again, it's just back to the whole, you know, famous quote of, you know, why do you why rob banks? And that's where the money is, right? right? I mean, so right now, right. That's where the money is, and this is a is a is a is a business endeavor, right? For the criminal enterprises, so they're going to do that for as long as that lasts, and then right. it's just like three card monte. They'll switch over to something that's either easier or scales or pays them more money, uh, or is more fluid or any of the you know triggers that they like. Um, but do the basics. I, I wish that I could tell you something really clever, but and to me, that's one of the basics, right? No, I don't. I mean, there isn't anything clever. I don't think there's anything new. Well, one of the things that what, what I'll add to that, I 100 percent agree with what Dutch was saying. But I mean, I, even if I you know try and be super objective, you know, and say, okay, well, um, we're talking about multi-factor authentication. What is the goal? Well, one of the main goals there is to prevent. Uh, account takeovers, right? To prevent accounts from being compromised and then mm -hmm. something malicious happening. Then we're like, okay, well, if, we're, if it's not multi-factor authentication, what are the other options? So one could argue and say, okay, well, if we have really strong user behavior uh, analytics, we're able to tell at any given moment what a particular user is doing and should be doing. Okay, yeah, you could do that, but that's expensive as hell, and it's still, uh, at least to the best of my knowledge, it still <laughs> it doesn't work for most organizations. You know, it, it's right. it's still a very expensive control. Something like multi-factor authentication, right? Again, that is a fairly uh, inexpensive control for m most systems. It's already built in the functionality. M most people just aren't taking advantage of the fact that it's there. And to Dutch's point, I mean, where we are in this point in time, it, it is a foundational security control, right? So, I mean, you could arguably say, how can we get that same outcome? I think we look at the other ways of trying to achieve the, how do we you know, prevent account takeovers? Multi-factor authentication is the, is the first one in line. You know, Dom, what are you, what are you helping SMBs with? Kind of like, boom, bad thing happens. Or write a boom. Yeah, yeah write a boom. I like, <laughs> I like that term. You know, it, it, it and the thing is, especially with the SMB space, it, it gets spliced into so many different segments. I mean, you, you at least have you have some SMBs 
that are prepared. That's a very small segment. That's a very small yeah. slice. But, but growing, that, that, they are getting but, better. But, 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 but growing, and you know, often many of them have very good relationships with their insurance providers. So if something happens, they're able to work with their insurance providers. We're able to to, to, to come in and help them. And you know, insurance providers provide very, you know, I don't want to say strict guidelines, but very set steps in terms of ABC. Here's mm-hmm. here's how you clean up, and then we're able to focus with them in terms of okay, this happened. So you had the massive heart attack, you survived. We're now the nutritionist after to say, here's your new game plan. Here's a new way to have a healthy lifestyle as, as a small and mid-sized organization moving forward. You know, So um, that is a growing slice. The ones where we struggle the most with, though, Brian, are organizations that reach out to us, and they're already days into a ransomware situation. Mm-hmm. I honestly can't tell you over the course of the past year how many uh, organizations have reached out to us saying, hey, we're on day three, day four, day five, day six of no, you know, we we're, weren't had ransomware or have ransomware. We're struggling. Can you can you help us? Uh, even had one reach out who said, you know what, if we can't get this fixed tomorrow, we're going to shut down. And I said, you know what, I'm pretty sure our phone number isn't one eight hundred miracles, but you know, thanks for calling anyway. <laughs> but um, you know, there, there, there's a there's still this this notion within the S and B space that when they get hit by it, a lot of them will are either they're they're scared, they try to solve it themselves. Many of them think that they have the insurance, and when they call their insurance provider, they find out that they don't, or that mm-hmm. they because they because they neglected to do the basics, the insurance is null and void. Uh, so, I mean, that is still a sizable percentage of of organizations in the SMB space, and those are the ones that it's really hard to help because mm. um, they they recognize that there's a problem, obviously because they can't access anything. But when it comes to, okay, well, here's the cost of forensics, right? And uh, as you know, well, as you both know, digital forensics isn't cheap. I mean, we don't do that in-house. We have a, a, a partner who does that. But as soon as you bring in those types of people, the cost goes up. And they're like, mm-hmm. oh, we're not going to pay it. I was like, okay, well, what's it going to cost you when your company goes down for, for, right. for good in, you know, in, in five days? You know, I'm pretty sure this is a job. I didn't realize when you called me you had other options. That's why you called me. That's why you called <laughs> oh, that's why, us. I thought that's why you reached out. So, you know, Sorry, there's, there's, I misinterpreted still, the phone call. <laughs> there's, there's, there's still a level of, I, I don't want to call it arrogance, but it's, it's almost a level of that they, they just they, they really just don't under, understand. I really think that cognitive biases are, are one of the things that's at play here, right? Because there's a fundamental mm-hmm. disconnect because people, generally speaking, don't get excited about insurance. They don't yeah, get excited no. about actuary tables unless you're an actuary, right? It's just not something that that everybody, it, it doesn't engage with them. And so that risk mitigation, which is how we think about stuff and have for decades, doesn't play. It mm. doesn't resonate with people. So we've got to change the way that we talk about that I don't have a quick, easy answer for you, but we have to change the discussion to doing cybersecurity well enables your business to do these things safely. And, and, and I can, and, and let's start to try to put a number to that. Let's try to put something to that. But we've got to tell the story differently because if it's only about risk mitigation, then you just gave the pinnacle example. Even <laughs> after a dire event, like people still, it just still doesn't really resonate with them. So yeah. I would say to be, to be, to be, you know, fair, it's, there's a, the, the onus is on us as, as a, you know, as a, as, as a domain and, and people who work on this, we've got to talk about this differently. We've got yeah. to talk about this, you know, as here's how I can help you grow your business. Here's how I make it be faster here, you know, and part of that is safer. Right, but it's got to be. It's just that we have to change that language so that we can start to at least with the next generation talk about it in a different way. Because if it's always just risk mitigation, then everybody feels like it's you know somebody back there behind you know the walls, I and mean, it just doesn't it doesn't connect with people. There's I I will I will say that I think during a reactionary moment like that example that that Dom gave, like no one's thinking about like growing the business. You're thinking about That's saving fair. the business, right? right. So like my house you know, starts flooding, right? I'm going to, I'm not worrying about putting on the addition uh, on the back, yeah. back of the house next. I'm like, that's completely out the mind. Like, I'm like, I'm even like now recalibrating and going, oh, all that money I was going to spend to build that, that new deck. Mm-hmm. Like, I need to now think about putting it into this. So when the insurance guy comes back to me and says, yeah, we can cover 80% of the cost because of whatever reasons and exceptions mm-hmm. in your policy. I'm sitting there going, okay, well, 
I mean, th this is kind of what I'm left with. Like, this is the reality of the situation. I have to deal with it. And I need to now pay the 20% of the cost to bring my organization back to good. I think there's a level setting in reality that people have to have on what repair looks like when it comes to cybersecurity. Like, how bad can ransomware be? How bad can data, data exfiltration on your company be? And you're sitting mm -hmm. there going like, oh, well, this isn't too bad. You're going, you're a manufacturing firm. All your PLCs and data systems, like, they no longer communicate to anything because they're bricked. Mm -hmm. What is the value there? And I think you probably, if you peeled it back, you probably, you know, if you had discussions with her directors of IT or whoever was in there, they would probably tell you stories that that person didn't really value the importance of IT itself or what technology right. did. And it was just maybe this magic box that did something. And why does it cost so much? Like, why don't the things just work? Right? That type of mentality is probably what led to why isn't this only $500 to clean up? It's like, I'm sorry, this isn't a spill in aisle three. Like, <laughs> this, is, yeah. this is your livelihood okay. and your legacy. But that's a good point, Brian. That's kind of the, to me, there's a bridging way of doing that, right? So you're right. Like once the, the, the dam is broken or the issue, you're right. I don't mean like the, and that, and then we're in containment, firefighting, right. get recovery mode, hundred percent. But there's a bridging conversation where it, you say, what would it cost you? Like, and I had this conversation and I hope I've never said it before because Hoagland's going to go through the files and find this and then. And then I'll just have to hold this unicorn and hope that that distracts people for a minute. So I'm going to use a, a certain three-letter cloud provider to do data analytics on all the videos I've, yeah. I've run looking yeah, for absolutely. this example Easy. you're about to give. It's running right now, I'm sure. It's running in the background. So uh, I was working with a, a healthcare provider and, um, you know, that we had a conversation. It was the same kind of, and it was, I was in the IT networking space at the time and we talked about well, you know, how do we get this new thing done? Doesn't even matter really what it was. And we changed the conversation to, okay, let's go talk to radiology and A, the bad thing, what if you couldn't take pictures and send them via the network? So that was kind of the obvious like, uh, oh, risk mitigation. So we, we, we got their attention. And when I say we, I mean like me, the CIO, like it wasn't, you know, it was like the, the technology staff. And then we right. said, okay, what if you could do more? And you're like, what do you mean? Well, what if you, I mean, you know, what if you could take more pictures per hour per day? And they're like, well, yeah, we'd be able to get more, we would be able to get, I say customer, we'd be able to get more patients, clients in. And we're like, yeah, they're like, well, that's a good thing. We're like, yeah, that's a good thing. You know what I mean? So we started with the kind of to, uh, the risk mitigation piece, right? Like, whoa, what would this bad thing be? And, and we, we actually, by the way, we put numbers to it, right? Yeah. How much do you do per hour? What would that be? How long would it take us to come back with five nines of reliability that equates to, you know, we, we, we did it all out, a little chart, and that got their attention so we could have a conversation. And then we shifted it to, okay, how can I help make this faster, better, easier? You know, how do we make sure that it gets stored in case, or, you know, I mean, and then you change the conversation. So I feel like we need a better kind of playbook that we all use to have that kind of a conversation. I defer to Dom. I mean, you, you have those conversations that that way more than I do today. But I think we're also uh, uh, being affected by the mentality for a long time was waterfall. And I don't mean just software development, I mean, period. And what I mean is enterprise uh, companies who made a thing, made it for other enterprises, right? mostly, right? And they were like, yeah, and eventually it'll get to mid mid, mid market, and then it'll get to, you know, SMB, and we had all these kind of arbitrary striations of what that even meant. But it was always like, well, we're going to go build this for insert your favorite, you know, name brand up here. Mm -hmm. And the problem is, arguably, I could make the case that they're better protected. It's actually the opposite end of the spectrum that really, really needs the help when it oh, comes yeah. to cybersecurity. Yeah. You know what I mean? Dom and I could raise both of our hands and, and stand here and be <laughs> like, that's exactly why hand. we do what we're doing. Like, it's like, yes, those yeah. guys need it. There's not a lot that's custom built or purpose built for the SMB. Hey. And the SMB can anywhere between like $0 to like $3 billion in revenue. It's a huge thing. But I, right. I say this to folks. I, we don't work with and don't, and like, I don't think the Fortune 2000 needs help. And remember, there's only 2,000 companies in that bucket. Mm -hmm. There are 100,000 other companies in the U.S., Canada and the world that aren't in the Fortune 2000 that we need to think about. And by the way, the Fortune 2000 relies heavily on everyone who's outside the Fortune 2000. 
That's a good point. Right. Insurance premiums are going up. Can yeah. organizations actually show a good security uh, program or posture to help reduce the cost of that insurance? Because I know we were just talking about it, like as far as yeah. insurance goes and using it, but everyone needs to try to get it. I think the premiums are going to go go up. So are companies who are purchasing in a position to go, hey, I'm a good risk. Trust me. Why? Right. And present that. You know, you think that's going to happen now. Yeah, Brian, I'll, you want to go? I'll, 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 I'll absolutely take that first. You know, yeah. the, the um, it's, 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 it's funny, Brian, you know, um, I've seen over the past year or so, I've seen organizations reach out saying, hey, well, we've had cyber insurance for the past five years. Now we can't get it this year because apparently, you know, we're no longer insurable because we haven't done the basics. <laughs> we're not able to, you know, to, to actually uh, to demonstrate that, that we understand even what cyber risk is. So um, I think there's, there's I think it is possible, but it's going to require a, a big shift in mindset because, you know, for, again, the big bucket of SMBs, the vast majority of them still saw cyber insurance as a get out of jail card, right? They did nothing because nothing was asked of them, or they would get, you know, some very high level questionnaires and say yes, no. And a lot of them, I know organizations who just said yes, even though they knew full well that they didn't have that in place. Right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, to insure on an insurance uh, application, that's shocking, but it, 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 it happens. Shocking, <laughs> I say. <laughs> shocking. shocking. Right? So, that is shocking. So I, 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 th I, I do think that the organizations that um, really understand their cyber risk uh, appetite and their cyber risk tolerance, they will put the work needed to make that happen because at the end of the day, that's an, uh, part of their risk management tool is having cyber insurance as part of their overall cyber risk function. But very, I think we're going to see, we're gonna see tool. Yeah, we're going to see a, a still have a, a big bucket that is either unwilling or unable to make noticeable steps forward from uh, um, uh, being able to demonstrate the basics, right? And now they're going to be in the uninsurable bucket. So that's the bucket that I'm interested to see what happens. And I don't mm. really have an answer for that right now. <laughs> wait, wait and see. <laughs> Yeah. Dutch, do you do you see anything different maybe at the enterprise level of like companies trying to position their posture? Yeah, uh, no, no, actually, I don't know that it's different. Sorry, I was thinking okay. through. I, I don't know this different. A, I, I agree what I hear, right, is that premiums are going up. So that's, 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 I, I don't deal with that directly myself, but that is what I hear also. So I, I think like, how would you set those premiums and how would you demonstrate, which was your question, right? How would I demonstrate mm -hmm. due care, right? Because right. that's kind of the, the principle you look at. And I, I think sort of if we stepped out of cybersecurity for a minute, how would you do that? Well, number one, you'd have a large data set that you could could mine and look at, right? So for driving a car, we have that, right? Because the CDC has been tracking that since the 40s, right? So my 17 year old is much more expensive than any of us driving the car, right? Because we have right. a data set to, to, to go against, right? Now then over a period of time, she gets to demonstrate that she's an above average driver. Right? right, so now you start to get a more qualitative measurement of her what really should be right, but she starts from zero, worst case, right? Yep. And so, and the other way of looking at it potentially is you look at sort of a, a standard or platonic ideal. It should be this. This is what good looks like, mm -hmm. right? That would be another way of doing it. But we don't. I would argue we don't have either of those really very well today, right? We we haven't measured in this fashion the data for a long enough period of time i think to be a really great data set and we don't have a platonic ideal right? we could all throw ones out we you know that everybody's familiar we could throw out nist or we could throw out a variety of frameworks and and uh, uk cyber essentials and different ones for different countries right but there's, that's not agreed upon right like, we would all go those are all good practices like I, we're not arguing against them but there's not one you know right. there's not like a standard that we'd agree, unless it's super granular, like, oh, yeah, you must do this for PCI DSS. Okay. But that's a control measure, right? It's not really a framework. So I think we're, we're the miss is we're not sure how to measure this. So you're left with me as, you know, if I was the three of us started a company tomorrow, I'd say, well, we're, we're better postured than we were a year ago. So does that count? You know what I mean? Like you could show, you could show progress towards a goal where the goalposts keep shifting. Hey, so I want to say this is this is so much fun because we're looking back over this time period, right? Like you kind of brought that up at the beginning. I, I appreciate you guys' friendship. I love staying connected to you. I think this is proof positive that you can develop and maintain legitimate connections with people um, in a virtual environment like this. And, and we've been able to do this. And that does not take away from the fact that we absolutely want to get on your corporate jet 
you know, when you go public and, uh, and, and I'm assuming you're going to take us to like somewhere cool, like Newfoundland, you know, something like that. <laughs> so let's make that happen. But no, I'm thrilled. I'm glad we could do this again. You know, let's, let's keep this going in the future. Definitely. I, I genuinely appreciate the, uh, um, both of you. I mean, this is the, the two of you have just been uh, amazing friends to your point Dutch. Uh, it's just, it's really cool to be, you know, uh, build uh, a relationship, build a friendship. Uh, during this time and using the Iowa reference from earlier, you know, if you build it, uh, they will come, you know, so whether we meet at the field of dreams one day in Iowa or, you know, some other remote spot in Canada here, uh, appreciate you boys, appreciate the, the opportunity to always chat. And hopefully we just do a sort of a fast and furious type series and we just keep going until both, uh, we're all just sick and tired of each other. Family, family. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Uh, I too, guys. No, thank you so much for both being on. I'm sorry Cyber Pig didn't make it. Uh, this has been a great episode three or four we're on. I, I mean, yes, I think we should definitely keep doing these. Um, and it's been great to look back and obviously see kind of where things have, have gone on. The friendship, uh, the content that both of you have put out is phenomenal. Um, I, I love Thanks. seeing everything you guys are both doing. If anybody's out there, uh, hopefully you are, and it's not just the three of us watching our own video later, uh, do subscribe down below. Do check out both Dom and Dutch on LinkedIn. Make sure you follow both of them for any of uh, their great updates and insights. Uh, you'll see probably all of us around social media land. If you can't find me, you can check out hashtag CISO Life, but you can obviously follow Dutch Schwartz and Dominic Vogel. I'm Brian Hoagley, your host. It's been another great InfoSec Rat Pack. See you next time. Be safe, be good, and we'll see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.